Shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Bricks King Podcast, where I'm going to bend your ear about Lego, review those amazing bricks of plastic, and discuss what is new and up and coming around the Lego world. I'm your minifig host, Matt. Let's build on it. Welcome in, everybody. Hopefully you are doing well. Hopefully you are staying warm in this cold time of year for most of us, many of you way colder than I am. However, we are here to discuss Lego Masters, the exit interviews. Today we have Steven and Steven, and I don't want to take away from their time, so let's go ahead and jump straight in and hear what they had to say about their experience on Lego Masters Season 3. What a great run that you had. I have to say, on a personal note, I enjoyed every single one of your builds, and I, I actually lost count of the number of episodes where I saw teams being named to the final two. And I was like, how are they not in the final two this week? Uh, you had so many fantastic builds. I just, uh, and I, I love that it was an all Canada final too, but I just, I, I really, really, I've got to say out of all, all the teams, I consistently enjoyed your builds absolutely the most. So Thank you. that being said, my first question for you is, even, and we saw this, I think, even in the final last night, there's lots of great builds, lots of great teams, but you, on TV, we get to see the builds for about like 10 to 15 seconds. We don't get to see a lot of the details. What are some of the details that you put into last night's builds or any of the builds over the season that you wish had been shown that you'd like us to know more about? Oh, uh, there, there's lots and lots, to be perfectly honest. Um I pride myself as a details guy and Crash and I gave ourselves ample time at the end of every challenge to make sure we could put details in. And I, I actually have read some online commentaries that some people didn't like this season because the builders weren't doing very detailed builds. I can assure you, absolutely, everybody put in these little details. It's just by pure number of hours, you can't capture it all for, for TV purposes. Um, you know, builders like Greg and Brendan and uh, Nick and Stacy were, were notorious for having like exceptional little content that was hidden all over. Um, as far as we go, I, I, I do a lot of builds for conventions as well as kids events and, and, uh, and for big demonstration purposes. And I've found myself to be doing all kinds of Easter eggs. And that was something Crash and I had a lot of fun with this season as well. So tucking in the tiny little details that 95% of the population will never see, but I know it was there. <laughs> um, one of my favorites, to be honest, is the Treehouse Challenge. If your viewers or yourself, or if you've ever been to the Lego house in Denmark, uh, there's a big sculpture in the middle of it called the Tree of Creativity. And it was created by a gentleman by the name of Stuart Harris. And Stuart Harris is absolutely awesome, incredible designer and an all around nice person. Uh, but one of the things that he did on the main trunk section of the Tree of Creativity is he effectively carved. So he sculpted in little builds that were reminiscent of some of the earliest builds of Lego lore, like the wooden toys. Um, so the Treehouse build, You'll never see it, but in one of the little sections, I notched out a chunk of the sculpted box around the branches, and I did a little duck that was built into the bark of the tree. Um, and after the challenge was done, Brickmaster Jamie actually picked up on it, and he took a photo, and he said, oh, I'm going to send this to Stuart. <laughs> so I, I love that, that little detail. Uh, hey, Crash, how about you? You got anything that you're thinking of right now? Uh, the Invisible Men on the uh, the camp build. That's one of my yeah. favorite details that we put in there that no one picked up on. Uh, so that was that was pretty interesting. I don't know. It, for me, some of the some of the little details uh, were for us and for the cast and for the crew. Uh, yeah. Can't really talk about them in mixed company, but there was some stuff on there that it makes me giggle every time I think about it. And then every time it pops up on the screen and I can see little hints of these little things that we did just to kind of goof around with the, the cast and crew made me smile every time they came up. Yeah, we had a lot of hidden content, a lot of hidden jokes. Uh, that 
those are the fun stories. Those are the ones we get to kind of pick up and talk about at conventions when when people pull outside and ask us for specific stories. But I think uh, Crash and I are definitely live in the moments kind of guys. So we we both made a point of enjoying our builds and our builds were enjoyable because we included our friends and family and extra stories to them. So it was good fun. And I think that definitely came through in your builds. I'm going to definitely have to take a look at that treehouse build to see if uh, it, it shows in any of the pictures. Because I, I do know Stuart and I have been to Lego House, so I know exactly exactly what you're talking about. Uh, my second question is, clearly you're both very experienced Lego builders. What was the biggest challenge for you in adjusting to building there on the set? Oh, for me, it's time management. Um, like my, my tabletop in my little studio has projects. Like I'm just sitting here looking at it. There's projects that have been sitting here for days, weeks, months. Um, underneath, there's projects that have been sitting there for years. So when it comes to uh, a designing aspect of it, I, I have to revisit models occasionally. Sometimes I have to put them away until I have the proper creative mindset for it. Uh, we simply did not have that as a luxury on the show. Um, it, it would be pretty easy for me to put 30 hours into a project here at home, but most of our challenges were in that 10 to 11 hour range, plus or minus a couple hours. So you had to be purposeful. You had to be mindful of, of the time you put into things. And after about episode two, I think we found a recipe that worked pretty good for us uh, as far as time management. And then we, we budgeted and allotted times for specific components of each build, knowing that we had to continually move forward for something that told a story because that that was effectively what we were going to be judged on as the overall story. Um, Crash kept me honest on that because sometimes I I try to revisit things too much, but we had to keep moving forward. Crash, what about you? Um, so I appreciate the compliment that we're experienced Lego builders. I don't build mocks at all. I'm a set builder. All those modulars behind you, that's what I do. Um, so you can see in the first episode, Steve says, Heck, this isn't in my wheelhouse when we're trying to build the Technic frame. And I was like, all right, I'll do it. I had no idea what I was doing. And Jamie comes up and says, that's interesting, but it worked. <laughs> uh, same with uh, when we get to the camp build and I'm trying to build a brick built figure for our giant uh, on the side. And they make a joke about it on the show where everyone's frantically running around with no time left. Hey, I got to do this. Oh, I can't believe there's no bricks for this. And then they cut to me and it's how do I build a butt? I legit had no idea how to build a brick built figure. I had to go to Ethan, Dom, Nick, and uh, and Justin to get hips on how to do it. So uh, just new techniques. I'd never done curving Lego before the treehouse build. So that was new to me. Uh, and then we ended up using it again in our final build. There was like all these little things. And it was kind of nice being uh, kind of virginal to some of these techniques because uh, it, I remember when we were building the final build and putting some trees together, Nick came over and looked at one of my trees and went, what the heck? How did you, that's amazing. How did you figure that out? I'm like, I don't know. The bricks go together. It's what I did. So for, yeah, that, that for me, time management is always a big thing, but if we keep each other honest, we're fine. But for me, the biggest thing was learning technique. That you, you, you give me hope because as you say, the modulars behind me is the extent of a lot of my building lately as well. I've gotten away from mocks as well. So may, maybe one day I can be where you are. Absolutely. Um, my last question for you is, um, Stephen, you mentioned one interaction with Jamie with respect to the treehouse build. Are there any other interactions with um, Will or Amy and Jamie that didn't make it on the camera that you'd like to share? Uh, <laughs> that I can share? No, <laughs> so much. Um, this uh, this is a, a, a big, big, big question. <laughs> uh, so do, most of those table hits, especially with Will, uh, he comes around and he spends 10, 12 minutes with each table to get content, right? For us, it was closer to half hour, 45 minutes every time he hit the table. We would tell jokes and stories and talk hockey and uh, just goof around. We had a lot of the same sensibilities. He and Steve are roughly the same age. Um, a lot of same interests. It was great. Like he would, he would literally camp out at our table and just hang out. It was awesome. Um, as far as Amy and Jamie go, uh, I mean, they showed up every day and it was awesome to have them there, but the on-screen interactions um, never made it to TV. Like if you watch from episode, we didn't have them at our table in the edit. 
after episode two until the NASCAR episode. It it was just not something that happened because it wasn't very dynamic. They were judging and didn't play with us. So yeah. the interaction was different. That's not to say they weren't awesome people off camera and could talk to us and whatever, but they were there performing a role. And Steve and I are not the type of people that will sit there and talk technique and critique for hours on end as a pair. So when it came to that type of stuff, it just, it didn't make for a good solid interaction as far as TV is concerned, but Will, Will would hang out for hours and hours if he could. Yeah, um, absolutely. Did the dynamic we had with Will was uh, heartfelt and genuine. I, I was actually at many, many different stages of our time there. I, I just felt like, I can't believe he is this like down to earth and easygoing and approachable and, and charismatic. Like the man literally cared about our comings and goings and what we were doing and how we were feeling. And um, there were times and places where there was some affected morale through departures of teams or challenges, maybe not going exactly as planned. And he was all part of that support system. He was, uh, he was great. Like I, I can't say enough good things about him because I think you have this concept that maybe Hollywood personalities act their personalities but i never got that impression i felt like he was very legitimate and open and and honest um as far as the brick masters go for me personally i've followed jamie berard's career for a long time he's a total mentor in the in the community for not just me but a lot of other people um and there was a couple of times admittedly my focus changed to try to impress brick master jamie um which I needed like the, the Jurassic challenge kind of got away from us. It was very early in how we were trying to figure things out. And the brick masters came to our table and said, okay, tell us about your story. So we tell him the story. He goes, okay, what are you working on? And he's a modular builder. He's a building builder. So I'm hammering in outrageously detailed components to the main floors of our buildings. And then he said, okay, so what is your story? And we tell him the story. And he goes, so what are you working on? And I'm like, oh, apparently I'm working on the wrong thing right now. <laughs> so to get feedback from them was amazing because they truly are, you know, they're, they're well-respected in their field. Um, uh, it's my belief that Jamie Burrard is perhaps the greatest designer that Lego's ever hired. So like to, to get the feedback, the good, the bad, the indifferent, um, that, that meant the world to me. And there was at least a couple of times where we got some good compliments throughout the judging from the brick masters and I would lean into crash and go, okay, I can go home now. I'm totally satisfied. <laughs> I got a, I got a pump up from one of my mentors. So fantastic. I could talk to you for the entire hour, but unfortunately there are other people who are waiting to, to ask you questions. It has been a joy watching your builds this season. I'm so glad. Yeah, we were able to do that. And I hope I'm able to meet you in person someday at a convention, especially if you come to brick world, Chicago. You know, Brick World Chicago is on my radar. I'm really sorry I missed it last year. I had some personal commitments I, I had previously gotten involved with. Um, that said, if you track me down on social media, if you need anything else talked about, if you want to have a sidebar conversation, totally open to that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, cool. Megan. All right. So I was just saying that I'm really excited that uh, after three seasons, I finally get to speak to Canadians on this show. Woo! <laughs> True North. <laughs> So uh, my first question for you, uh, you guys had so many great builds this season. I can tell you that my favorite was your, your troll and the bridge build. That was absolutely awesome. <laughs> Thank but, you. Uh, I'm curious, what was your favorite build of the season and why? Josh, you want to lead off? Uh, oh, there's different ways to answer this. I, I loved the Dalmatian. That was a great build uh, because we got to do something really cool and different and we took a different approach to it than any other team so that was awesome um the troll bridge because i got to play with storytelling and uh none of that made it to tv because it was all inside jokes for cast uh so one day you'll have to hunt me down and i'll tell you what the actual story that we presented was because it was awesome the entire was. cast was howling laughing it was great um but my favorite build was the bull rider that was the one where I kind of got to take the lead a little bit. Um, Steve turned to me and went, I have no idea how to do this. I'm like, dude, I got this. 
And Steve built an amazing Technic frame that's probably still sitting on Jamie's desk somewhere in Denmark because it was that strong. There's no way they were taking that apart. We had an awesome story. I named the bull rider after a buddy of ours that used to ride bulls in high school. I got to put all these little goofy bits and pieces into the story and into his, his, the way he was dressed. I built cowboy boots that had rhinestones in them that don't show up on screen very much. That was when our little friendly competition with the doctors started. So I got to build a giant belt buckle with the same rodeo that they competed in as the doctor squid and ours was bigger. So we won it. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun to do that bull rider challenge. That's probably my favorite. As for me, the Dalmatian was my second favorite, just simply from the fact that uh, we it was a, the first time that we had really kind of stepped out there and went in a very different direction. Uh, I think you start looking around the room, like making sure there's this self doubt that that creeps in and make you want to make sure you're, you're sticking to what everyone else is doing. But that one from very early on, we, we picked a direction that was super different um, and we were rewarded for for that that challenge. I think um, we did a lot of things that went very well for that challenge but uh personally i think it was just that stepping away from the norm and the, the brick masters really enjoy that Le- little leap of faith um as far as my all-time favorite episode oh the mini golf one i was bummed we didn't get top two but clearly the, there was a lot of really good builds in the room that day so i can't i can't say that we were robbed or anything there was just a lot of really really amazing content that the teams were really picking their game up by that stage. But when we walked out, it was the first challenge where I had this instant reference in my head. And I just said to Steve, follow my lead. I got this. I know exactly what I want to do for this one. Um, tapped into that classic yellow castle. And I'm not too sure you can actually see it sitting on my shelf there. Um, we played it off of all kinds of the the lore behind it and maybe going back to actually something uh, Megan asked us in the previous interview about details that weren't captured one of the things I'm most proud about of that build never ever made it to show um, you can basically see the corner of it in one of the photos that I posted but where you tap the ball to start the um, the the course at the box there are these markers on either side and they're little tiny yellow castle turrets. And within the middle of the castle turret is a brick built horse, which is iconic to that year and model. They didn't have the one piece molded uh, horses back then. So you had to build it with slopes and plates and bricks. Um, so I did a macro version about four or five times bigger than, than the actual set. And it was just a very simple detail and almost nobody picked up on it except for Jamie Burrard, who took out his own personal camera and walked over and took a photo of it and smiled as he walked away. And those little victories were so, so near and dear to me, but I loved that build. I loved that one. There are definitely lots of great builds from you guys this season. Thank you. Uh, my second question, uh, and you've already touched on this a little bit in terms of uh, sharing some of your interests and in sets and things, but I'd like to know, uh, what are your Lego stories? How did you get into the hobby? Crash, you want to go? No, you lead this one because yours is way more interesting than mine. <laughs> uh, all the way back to 1979, um, I, I had a family member. My, my dad's side of the family is from Europe, and I had a family member come back from Europe, and Lego was quite a bit more popular back then uh, in that part of the world. So she brought back a set, and it was that Yellow Castle. And it was like nothing I'd ever had before. I was five years old, 1979, um, and built it, took it apart, rebuilt it, took it apart, built it, took it apart. Like it just kept going on and on. And then I started creating my own things. And that's around the time where Classic Space was making its appearance. And then that was all I ever wanted. Uh, It became known to all family members for birthdays, Christmases, the only thing Steven wants and or needs is Lego and more Lego and more Lego. And there's pictures of me as a kid with boxes of Lego stacked on my lap and I would disappear to my room for the entire rest of Christmas break. Um, so the love affair started early for me and it, it remained pretty much consistent throughout my life. It spent some time in the underground, the, the supposed dark years that most of us have. Uh, it was always in the peripheral. And then in 2004, I started my own family and um, my kids showed early interest. And then that just gave me the license to go crazy. 
I kept buying more and more telling my wife, it's for the kids, it's for the kids. <laughs> and now I have this awesome Lego studio and my kids are still involved in the hobby. So that, that pleases me because it ends up being a multi-generational thing at this point. My story is a little different. Um, as just like every other person that you'll probably talk to from the show, it started as a kid. Uh, I remember getting like little tubs of Lego and being at my grandparents' house and building their Lego from when my, my dad and his brother were kids in England. I was in this green suitcase and I play with that and go build. And I come home and I build more out of my big blue tub uh, and just build scenes and scenes and scenes. And then I started getting um, like themed sets, the Mtron and the Blacktron space stuff which was awesome. It had magnets, it had lime green windows. Like it, it was super bright and colorful. And I played off of that forever and ever and ever. And then uh, just, just like Steve, I had my dark years. I got to be a teenager and girls and parties and all of that start to set in and then uh, kind of faded to the background, but I never got rid of it. And then when I became a fire, just before I became a firefighter, no, it was after I became a firefighter in 2009, a buddy of mine, knew I was a big comic book nerd and they had just released the new Batman sets. Like it was the first time in earnest that Batman had had Lego sets and he bought me the Batwing with the Joker helicopter. And I was like, Oh dude, this is awesome. And that boxing day morning, I went to Toys R Us and bought them out of every Batman set that they had. And I'm still only missing one, the, the Robin and Penguin submarine set from that from that first initial run it bothers me to this day but that was what rekindled it and then i got the fire hall modular one year and i was like oh i need to get all of these now so i scouted out for the the three that i was missing online and got those and then every year january 1st i'd be in line to get the new modular that's actually how steve and i met was me waiting in line on january 1st being fourth in line and steve me wearing a calgary firefighters t-shirt and steve walking up you're a firefighter i'm a firefighter too cool let's stand in line together and go get lego and that that's what fired up 13 and a half years of friendship yep never actually worked a shift together it's weird that's weird all right nice so uh last question um i get asked this one a lot especially since the pandemic with more and more adults coming into the lego hobby so you guys both mentioned that you went through a dark age so what would be your uh, biggest advice to someone who is either coming back to lego as a hobby or just getting into it as an adult for the first time. This isn't Pokemon. You don't catch them all. Yeah. Pace yourself. Yeah. You gotta... Pacing yourself is super important. You can uh, you can go through some financial hardships just trying to even stay within a theme. So yeah. really, really be mindful. Um, I'm now scrutinizing all of my purchases. I've isolated myself to just a couple of themes where I'm a bit of a completist. So I feel like I always need every aspect of it. So. I'm very, very picky. That's a promise to my wife because um, if left to my own devices, we'd be living in a cardboard box surrounded by Lego. So <laughs> you have to be really careful. You have to be really careful. Like Star Wars alone will bankrupt you. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. Harry Potter's turning into that. Marvel's turning into that. You gotta, you gotta pick, excuse me, you have to pick and choose kind of what lane you want to be in. I mean, it's okay to go out and like in my case, I'll go out and buy a Marvel set for the minifigs, but I stick to mostly architecture and the modulars because that's what I know that I get the most enjoyment out of is building those types of sets. Um, so yeah, just, just try and find something that makes you happy. Start there. And then if you want to branch out more, branch out more, but you're going to, you're going to go down some real, real trouble, trouble times. If you decide you want it all right away. Great. Well, those were my questions. So thank you very much. And congratulations again on thanks, making Thomas. it so far. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Thomas. I appreciate your kind words and keep up the good work that you're doing in the community. If there's anything I can do for you in the future, please feel free to reach out. I'll be sure to do that. Thank you very much. I man. Should you put that as your name on the, the banner underneath you, Steve? If you need anything, just uh, just feel free to reach out. I, I'm feeling the love. I'm feeling the love. I want to keep this uh, magical ride going as long as I can. <laughs> awesome. Hey, guys. Uh, happy you're here. But, man, I... I was I was really not happy at my TV last night. I was I was hoping that you guys are going to get it. Um, I'm not from Canada, but it was really cool to see all the Canadian representation, like Megan had mentioned. My question to you guys is: Your build last night was incredible. 
I was one of those people the entire season. I had you kind of like middle tier that didn't have you at the top, didn't have you at the bottom. And you guys just continued to step up every single week. Where, where did that come from? Because it seemed like in the beginning, you guys were kind of like there, but the builds just weren't as, as, as what they have been. So where, where was that jumping off point where you just kind of kicked into high gear? These right here, the ears. Yeah. Um, Big time. Steve, Steve and I, uh, the first episode in Steve had a, plan he's like i want to get a maltese cross out so we built a maltese cross because we knew that was something we were going to do at some point might as well knock it off the list right away um and then every build after that especially with jurassic world we learned our lesson pay attention to what the judges are telling you so every little bit of advice or critique that amy and jamie gave us we would put it to heart and incorporate it somehow into our build And I think that's another reason, if you were listening to part of the interviews earlier, another reason why they don't show a lot of Amy and Jamie at our table on TV is because we were one of the few teams that actually listened. So there's no drama when they come to our table and tell us to do something and we don't do it. They wanted more color. We put more color in. They wanted different shapes. We put different shapes in. Our story wasn't good. We changed our story. You know, all of those things uh, were really, really taken to heart. And we really appreciated everything that they gave us and understood what they were trying to tell us with all of their little veiled messages that came out of it. It was very interesting to me. I don't know if it's a a, a fact of we work in an environment where we are constantly getting feedback and having to adapt on feedback, but it, it didn't make sense to me to not listen to the brick masters and um, they're two of the greatest minds in the business so how could you not listen to them with a great deal of of authority in in the subject matter so it was a no-brainer for us to to kind of clue in and listen and i think builders inherently have their own style um so we stuck with what we knew early on for style but stylistically the brick masters who are judging us wanted different things from us so it was very easy for us to say oh you want more color no problem. I can give you color. You want more energy? No problem. Let's add energy. So when we got the feedback, we took it to heart. We listened, we incorporated so that when we got to the judge's table, we could at least say, we listened, we incorporated, here's our changes. This is what we did to make it more in line with what you guys wanted. So I think that worked in our favor. Great. That's, that's really nice to know. Taking that input from the two superstars (laughs) themselves is always uh, super important. So on that note, um, Amy and Jamie sometimes come across in the broadcast as very kind of intimidating to a certain degree. So out of the two of them, who did you kind of fear might not be the right word, but who kind of intimidated you the most? Well, both Crash and I are tall guys. We're both over six feet tall. And when Amy puts heels on, she's looking us in the eyes and sometimes looking down. <laughs> so she was a uh, a little bit intimidating, but I think more than intimidation, uh, I have a profound respect for the designers, especially Jamie Burrard. It's no secret. I'm, I'm totally fanboying over him. He's one of the greatest creators, if not the best designer Lego was ever hired. So um, for me, that intimidation factor probably came out of my need to want to please him and want to make him happy and make sure that we were doing things within his vision. So um, realizing those expectations was probably my my biggest fear in that dynamic with the Brickmasters. I think for me, it was uh, it, not intimidation, but trying to please Amy was was the hardest thing for me. I, I was super confident that Steve could pull off anything with technical skill that Jamie would be proud of to look at. Um, so I, I had no trepidation with Jamie's feedback. But anytime Amy would come by and give us some kind of note on story elements and color elements i it was sometimes um a little hard to try and incorporate some of that uh sometimes when you're when you have a an idea in mind and you have to do that even minor pivot it's it's a pain in the pain in the butt to try and uh to try and make that change at certain points of your build um so i'm i'm very happy with how how everything happened with the judges. But I think of the two, Amy was probably the one that 
for using your term, put the most fear into me because I, there, was, there were times I had no idea how to make it work, but we pulled it off. So hooray. Yay. <laughs> you pulled it off quite well. I got to admit. Thank you. All right. Last question I got for you guys last night, the finale episode will happen to mention, you know, he almost got a, a super emotional in comparison when you guys were talking about your build and having that connection there. What was that like to uh, not just last night, but he seemed to be past episodes and everything. He really seemed to kind of connect with you guys on a different level. Could you talk a little bit more about that? We're 10 year old boys, all of us. So, uh, I said this with the last interviewer, we, our relationship with Will was unique to that room. Um, I think the doctors were a little similar, but Will's hits were 10, 12 minutes long at each table just to get content. And he'd talk about the build and he'd try and play off of what you do with us. It was half hour, 45 minutes. And we would, there were jokes and stories and talking hockey and, uh, you know, little, little things like that family stuff. Cause he and Steve are roughly the same age. Um, I'm a big pop culture nerd. So we would talk about some of the stuff that he's done. Uh, we would discuss just life in general because we had similar outlooks. I think, I think we have a really unique opportunity with Will to engage him in a way that other teams in the past or even currently couldn't just because of the nature of the lives that Steve and I lead. Uh, and in the finale, uh, in particular, a lot of that emotion that you see on Will's face about Lake Louise was felt by a lot of uh, all the contestants other than Nick as well. I mean, Stacy used to vacation there. Dave and Emily used to vacation there because we, we all are in the Western part of Canada. Um, so it had a special connection to a lot of people in that room. And I think a lot of people got emotional about it. Like when we were telling our story, Stacy would interject and be like, I've been there. I love going hiking through there. And Dave and Emily told a story about how their parents, that was their one vacation that they could afford to do was driving from Vancouver to Lake Louise and going camping in the area. So uh, I think we pulled a lot of heartstrings in the room on that one. And uh, it, it showed up on camera, thankfully. Yeah, we, we definitely had a connection either by lifestyle or appreciation for one another's craft. He was very complimentary to our, our profession. And of course, Crash and I followed all kinds of his projects over the years from his voiceovers to full, full roles in movies and such. So I'm, I, I think there is some good mutual appreciation. And uh, I think I, I hate falling back on this one, but there's, there's a little bit of an advantage to having some age in the game and, and having that ability to to view things differently and and from a perspective of past experiences if you will i think will could totally identify with us i think we we demonstrated a lot of things that probably were totally in his wheelhouse in that time and frame of his life too so i think there was a a good natural connection i i thoroughly enjoyed my time with him and got to be honest three quarters of what we talked about is 100% not suitable for tv <laughs> so that's that's why not all of it made it to TV. <laughs> well, that, that is really cool to hear. Um, I always tell my wife I'm an eight-year-old trapped in a 38-year-old's body. So <laughs> I look forward to spending time with other 10-year-old adult men uh, in Chicago later this year. So thanks so much <laughs> for your time, guys. Looking forward to it, Matt. See you in Chicago. We are going to take a quick break before the rest of this interview continues. So stay with us. Hey, Stephen and Steven. So great to be talking to you both. Uh, you know, I think between all the different challenges we saw, uh, lots of classic space, castle, pirates, and of course the Marvel challenge for you, I feel like this was a really great chance for you to get a chance to build something in some of these themes that you love. So, you know, what did it mean to like get to finally like flex your muscles on those particular challenges, uh, you know, with all the bricks at your disposal? Oh, what a, what a unique opportunity to kind of spread your wings. I... <laughs> I think maybe Crash and I, it, it, it was either part of our success or a part of our failure. Before going down to Atlanta, I think a lot of other teams really sat back long and hard and tried to predict what challenges were going to happen. Being a fan of the show, I was 99% sure we couldn't predict anything. And yet we got stuff that dropped in our wheelhouse. So maybe had we had a chance to think about it in advance we probably would have overthought it so we were very impulsive when we came to having those moments like space oh uh, instead of doing a, a classic spaceship which 
I, I have a fondness for. We needed something that was in our wheelhouse that related to who we were. So we went the fire department angle, uh, pirate ships. I mean, I love, I love pirate ships. Pirate ships are awesome. <laughs> so we had, we had the privilege of having the right challenges on the right day. I think anyone, a good builder is, can be victim of a bad build day and a, and a bad, well, a, not a bad builder, but a builder less confident with the right challenge can always excel. I think a lot of things dropped into our lap that were very much in our wheelhouse. And, you know, the, the days that I had the creative uh, invigoration crash was right on my heels. And then there was days where I creatively faded and he leans in, he goes, I got this. I know exactly what we're doing. So um, much like any good relationship in this world, my bad days overlined with his good days and vice versa. So we never had a truly bad run. I don't think. Yeah. What he said. Um, no, we, <laughs> we did, we did get lucky that a lot of stuff um, kind of fell into where we are in our happy place. Um, having all of the bricks available was a blessing and a curse because sometimes having too many options made it hard to decide on a few things, but the nature of what Steve and I do is essentially here's the problem and you get thrown it, thrown it at you right away. Here's the problem. Go fix the problem. So the way our brains are wired and have been wired for over two, probably four decades between the two of us is just um, it, it's just here's what you here's what you have to fix. And here's what here's the steps we know to do to fix it. And uh, we applied that to Lego building. Here's the challenge ahead of you. These are the steps we know to complete that challenge. So we just applied those. And if something needed to be altered or whatever, we changed them on the fly. And we were pretty malleable and adaptable as the challenges rolled on. And that, that really worked in our favor, I think. I would agree. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Um, you know, obviously being firefighters was really central to your characters, if you will, on the show, uh, you know, calendar included, uh, Stephen. But also, you know, I just wanted to get a sense from you. What was the reception like back at home and at the station for, you know, all the great work you were able to do on the show? Every closeted Lego nerd in the fire department uh, is now out. Oh, man. I, I think there's the benefit of uh, having been very outward with my affection for Lego is it was no surprise. I think uh, like we had to keep everything quite quiet in the early stages. And then we both disappeared for a period of time. And not a lot of people at work actually knew what was going on. But the, <laughs> the reception afterwards was, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You guys would be doing that. So I don't think there were too many people that were overly surprised. Um, that said, my goodness, what a great deal of support, not even just within our job, the, the fan community online. Uh, I know the people that follow um, your, your podcast and, and whatnot, there, there's firefighters from all across North America that have been reaching out and saying, this is awesome. Thank you. I do this at my work too. And I'm so glad there's other people out there that do it. And I, I think that's, that's wicked. Like that's a great, great win for us. For Absolutely. sure. <laughs> um, my last question is, you know, obviously it's tough, you know, when you come up, you know, a little bit shorter than you wanted to in the finale, but I really respected just how gracious the two of you seemed in that moment. And really you turned to what an experience, what an opportunity and, and what a chance to be with your partner that this turned out to be. So I'm just curious to get, you know, what was your overall takeaway? You know, what are you leaving the show with now, you know, having looked back and on the whole experience and getting to watch, what, getting to watch it at home? We're leaving um, with, 24 new best friends. Yeah. Like the doctors, that relationship that we had with them and still do is, is a bond that can't be broken unless something meteoric happens. We talk to Austin and Justin literally every day. I, Stacy and I have a monthly phone call that we scheduled so that we could stay in touch. Um, I reach out to, to Dave and Emily a fair bit, mostly Emily cause she's goofy like me, but you know, that, all of these people, I, I like I talked to tacos for a half hour this morning just because was had nothing to do with the finale. It was just us talking. So I think the biggest victory that we could have asked for, forget the money. It's the relationships that we forged. Like it's it's unreal at the bonds that were created on this show. And I'm very happy that Steve and I got to play a small role in creating those uh, relationships. Yeah, absolutely. The The human connection aspect of it was our trophy from beginning to end. Um, 
right from our time landing in Atlanta before filming it even officially started, we we forged these connections with people like the docs in particular, but you know, in general, the entire cast and 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 crew really like we we we've developed relationships with the camera people the the lighting the hair and makeup and we're now following each other on social media and and whatnot and we're all like still engaged in one another's life um i think when you look back after something if you you come just a little bit short there there will always be a little bit of natural self-doubt and maybe a, a conversation in your head about the what ifs um but yesterday leading up to it i ha had uh, family and friends coming in and uh, we're going to watch with me. I really focused on what the, the outcome was as opposed to what it wasn't. I didn't want to focus on the fact that we didn't win. I wanted to focus on the fact that we made incredible connections and made incredible friends. Um, I got, I, I, we had the most privileged circumstance in the world where we got to remove ourselves from the day to day grind and throw ourselves into the deep end of our hobby to the most extreme level uninterrupted for days and weeks at a time. Like nobody, nobody gets to be that lucky. Like that, that was such an honor and a privilege and we got to explore our creativity. And sometimes as builders, we find ourselves limited by the product that's circumstantially in front of us, but we really didn't have those restrictions there. We could push ourselves. We could um, entertain ourselves. We could play off the other people in the room. So it, for me, this will never be about not winning. This will always be about having the greatest of times with this opportunity that was given. Well, that definitely came through on the show. So thanks again and congrats on everything you were able to do. And I hope I'll get to talk to you both again soon. I look forward to that. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Joy. Hello, hey. young going crash. You, I know that. that. Person. Thank you. Love yours too. <laughs> Making a fashion statement, as you said. Um, so good to see you again, and uh, congratulations on your run, as many um, have said before. Um, Thank you. I'm kind of curious about your process. I know we talked a lot during our interview, but we didn't really get a chance to talk about your process when you were given the challenge, when you went back to the table. What did you do? Did you, like, some, some teams do sketches on paper, some did some you know, just back and forth brainstorming and coming up with a list. What what was your process before you landed on your idea and went moving forward with that? I think in the, the very early moments after a challenge was given, we had the, the very significant luck of one or the other of us having a good, solid concept right away. So you'll often see us on the risers as the brick masters are talking to us. One of us is leaning into the other, like, I got it. I know what I want. I know what we should do. I know the direction we're going to go. So um, we both took turns kind of as a creative lead. But to the the AFOL community, I think when you start talking to people at conventions and when you're out and about in the community, people always ask, oh, are you a LDD, Lego digital designer, or are you a brick builder? I will and for always will be. And if you, you saw my workstation here as I'm talking, I'm, I'm sorting. I need bricks in my hands. Um, almost to a fault because we would run back to our table and crash would start to jot down some notes. And then I would just run over to the brick bit. <laughs> it was infuriating for him because I would just walk away and make conversation. <laughs> but what I, I needed to do is have physical product on the table. And if it was just a handful of two by fours, I could say, okay, building here, car here, building here, car here, fill the gaps. What do we need? And then the storyboard evolves from that. But I, I always needed bricks on the table. And I think, uh, I, I want to say every single challenge, we were the first people to have bricks on our table. Yeah, that's a fact. Yeah. Great. You want I, I took the lead on that crash. You want to jump there, in on any more? There's that? nothing else to add to it, man. Like we, uh, we just, we're tactile people. That's just the nature of our business. We, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find a phone charger. Phone's going to die here. And I want to keep talking to people. Um, we're tactile people. That's just the nature of what we do. We need to have something in front of us in order to, to make proper decisions. And uh, it's just, it was just the way we went there. Don't get us wrong. There are times when we wrote stuff out and there were times we pulled the iPad out, but 90% of what we did was bricks in hand. Let's go do this. And most of our ideas I don't think we spent any time on any build pre-planning anything. 
it was here's the challenge when they started giving us the parameters of the challenge and the rules read we would literally turn to each other and go okay this is what's happening here's what we're going to do i i can't think of an instance where we didn't have a plan immediately after the rules read and head to our table and the clock starts yeah we're very to help with your strategy too as far as um, moving forward you were able to start right away all right. My, my second question is you had touched on this a couple of times with regard to self-doubt and maybe imposter syndrome and being there in the limelight. If you had advice to give to other people considering this where they have self-doubt and they're, they don't have the confidence, what would you suggest that they, they do um, before maybe applying for this show or even just in life in general when, when they're having that self-doubt? Use it. Yep. Use your self-doubt. Make it a tool for you instead of a, a hindrance. Um, if you can take that little bit of trepidation or, uh, you know, that withholding yourself from trying something and turn it into uh, a moment for yourself to overcome something, just that's that's one of the greatest feelings in the world. Even if it's a little thing, like I don't think I can put this brick onto that stud just the way it's sitting to some of your biggest life's challenges, like asking a girl out to a dance in high school, right? Like if you can take that little bit of fear and put it to your advantage so that you are being dangerous cautiously, then you're going to be a lot further ahead in life. I, I would agree. You absolutely have to embrace that little bit of doubt to be able to push yourself a little bit harder. Um, one of the greatest attributes our team had was that Steve and I are both different in how we approach the hobby. Um, usually I buy a brand new set and I dump the bricks on my table, sort it out into my bins, and then I use it for a different project. Whereas Steve has uh, built a lot of the more uh, iconic newer sets. What that allowed him was the knowledge of techniques that have been developed in the last five years, which I largely have not followed because I'm not building the sets. I'm doing my own things. So I was able to bring that perspective of a mock builder. Steve was able to bring that perspective as a set builder. And then we complemented each other very, very well. Uh, another attribute of my partner crash. And I think we talked about it uh, when we were talking to you earlier, Naomi, but um, sometimes not knowing what you don't know is very, very powerful because there were a couple of times where I would look at what we had to accomplish and they, my Lego brain is saying it won't work. So I stopped myself from even trying and crash and be like, I'll make it work. I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. It doesn't go like that. He's like, no, no, it'll go like that. And he figured it out and it, it became very entertaining because I would often stop because I thought I had a limitation when the reality is that sometimes you have to push past that discomfort. Um, the imposter syndrome thing. I think even the winners of the previous seasons can probably identify people they know who are stronger, better builders in theory. Um, the dynamic of being successful on the show is, is quite a bit different than being successful in your own studio space and with your own lug. So don't, don't feel like you're not bringing something to the table because they wouldn't be looking at you if you didn't bring something to the table. So definitely push yourself past your comfort zones. If you think you're, you're weak in something, Talk to people in your lug, talk to your friends, talk to someone like us, reach out in the community um, and get some skill sets. Like prior to leaving for our time in Atlanta, I knew I was a little bit weak in the powered up programming. Talk to one of the guys in my local Lego store. Turns out he's a coder. So I sat with him for a couple hours and learned coding. So got to push yourself always, 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 always. That's great advice. And for my last question, which I have to admit is a bit of a selfish question because my inner child squealed when... Crash, you mentioned about the DC universe and Batman. And Batman's one of my favorite iconic characters. Um, so my question for you is, you were very excited about the Marvel challenge. And you had favorite. all these scenes to choose from. So if you were to choose a scene in the DC universe that you oh, could man. build, what scene would you build? Okay, so do I have to go DCEU or am I allowed to pick like the Michael Keaton Batman? Am I allowed to go Christopher Nolan films? What are we any, talking here? Any kind of anything related to the DC universe, because I don't think the DC universe gets as much love as the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Agreed. So, yeah, yeah. You, you, you choose what you think is the, the most iconic scene that you would like to build if you were given the same challenge in the DC universe rather than the Marvel universe. 
Good okay. Um, son of a gun, that's a tough one. There's two that kind of pop in my head from recent films. Um, selfishly, I'd want to do something from Superman 3 with Christopher Reeve just because it was shot in Calgary and I know the hotel that he smashes up. So that would be fun just on a personal level. But um, I'm thinking Dark Knight with Christopher Nolan, right? Arguably the greatest superhero movie that's ever been made, period. Doesn't matter if you're DC, Marvel, or independent. That is the greatest superhero movie to have ever been made. Um, I'd want to do the hospital scene where Joker blows it up. Or Ooh, the, yeah. uh, like that would be fun if we had an explosion challenge. Um, but the fight scene in the skyscraper in the dark night where he takes out all of the, the bad guys by swinging through the different levels and being able to build that girder system and bad guys and hostages and hang the Joker upside down with the two boats in the canal that he can view from where he is like that to me is the ultimate Lego DC scene would be building that if, especially with the minifig scale that we would have to do it in. Oh man, that would be so cool. Good answer. <laughs> really good answer. So Yo-Yo, do you have a scene in the DC universe that you would build? You know, I, I like some of the tie-ins when they, they brought in like Flash and Wonder Woman and, it was uh, like, I love doing the, the, the superhero movies with my family. It's one of those things where we all deliberately avoid the spoilers. We wait for them to come out and, and then we get the nice movie seats and then we go and, and hang out and in the theater and, and have a good family experience. Um, my wife is a huge fan of Wonder Woman. I mean, who's not such a powerful character, a great recreation of an old classic icon. Um, and then bringing in some of the, well, I, I call them satellite characters, but of course we're going to start seeing more and more of them. Like the, that whole universe of flash and uh, Aquaman. And like, there, there's some really cool origin stories that, that have come from that. Um, I love the idea of underwater scenes. So maybe if I were to go a DC scene, I would probably do something like an origin story of uh, Aqua, but otherwise like I, I love all comic book lore. So I would take on any challenge. That's great. Thank you for inspiring so many of us and for going through all your personal sacrifices for our entertainment. Thanks, Naomi. I appreciate it. Uh, I, have, I have a question, you know, from the beginning to the end, I, I like focusing kind of on the group dynamics. Um, and uh, I talked to some of your, your competitors who called you the beating heart of season three. And, uh, and they made some interesting observations about how previous seasons uh, the production may have tried to manufacture some drama. Um, and this year they tried to do that, but it ended up being kind of more tongue in cheek. You kind of forced the production to go positive in the fact that they leaned into it in the second half. Um, and I think really lifted the whole season. So how did you force them to do that? And, uh, and what would you say about how the group dynamics ended versus how they started? Oh, David, they, they, they got stronger and stronger. I think I shared the story for you, but for prosperity's sake, um, it started from the first hour we landed in Atlanta. We had to text the talent manager and say we were there. And she replied back and said, there's other contestants in the airport. Please don't talk to anybody. You need to be isolated. We waited for the production van to pick us up. I'm just going to uh, pop in real quick. These are the kind of conversations we just want to hold on just for future Lego okay. Masters contestants <laughs> just to keep it kind of a surprise. So do, I'm just going to pop in. No, no. Sorry, Joy. I, I didn't realize I was oversharing. Um, no worries. That's why I'm here. But but going back, Dave, to what you were saying, uh, there was an immediate connection we had with with teams, like right from the word go either by circumstance or by hobby, there was an obvious connection and the, the, the early stages of our, our time on competition were, were very focused on team dynamic. Um, and then team dynamic didn't mean just with your team. We would often find ourselves standing at somebody else's table talking about strategies. And um, at one point I remember talking to Eddie about how by using a headlight brick, you can create a gap of a half plate and that, that allows you to do different building techniques. Honestly, 
I, I think we just got stronger and stronger and stronger and the love and outpouring of affection that we've got from all cast members in the last week has been nothing short of remarkable. So, yeah, I, uh, without going too inside baseball. So joy yells at us again. Um, <laughs> I was pretty nice. I didn't yell. <laughs> Uh, we, how do, how do I word this without giving too much away? We were in, um, we kind of had a week to get to know each other before filming started and I'll just leave it at that. So there was a chance for us to get together and bond over things other than Lego because we didn't have to worry about competing right away. Um, so that helped a little bit with building some preliminary building blocks to relationships with people in the room. We had an instant connection with some of the more outgoing people because I don't know if you know this, I'm a pretty loud, outgoing, overbearing personality. Uh, so that worked in our favor. So the doctors immediately, brothers from uh, other mothers, like they're Nick and Stacy. Stacy is one of the bubbliest, most effervescent personalities I've ever met in my life uh, and the kindest, sweetest person. Dave and Emily are big and brash and bold for such small people relative to me. Um, so that that helped because now we've got kind of a core group of people that we can fall back on when we have tough days and they can come to us when they have tough days. And then the whole group at like everybody, all 26, I believe, by the end of it, 26 of us, um, the production got mad at me when I started doing this. But I remember in the room, somebody being like, we need something to get us hyped up for the first day of shooting. And I did this thing where I yelled at the top of my lungs and we had this, I had this cadence and got everybody kind of ready to go out. And that was done in the green room. And then the next day they didn't let me do it in the green room. Like they wanted us moving. So I, we asked if we could do it on set and they said no. And I did it anyway. And then I did it out anyway again the next day. And then eventually it just became this thing where we had crew out on the stage floor yeah. waiting for me to do this big, like get everybody pumped up start of the day. We got to shoot today, lose my voice, scream at everybody, get them all in the right headspace thing. And that really helped us as well. I think, I mean, I know a lot of other people got a lot out of it because they've told me as much for me, it was just a way to kind of make sure that everyone was on the same page and ready to go. Cause of my sports background, that was just something that you did. You got everybody together in a big group and you did this thing to get everybody amped up. You can see it when the New Orleans Saints come out and do the who dat and who day uh, jumping up around and hockey teams do it in the locker room. Let's, you know, the big chant, let's go boys. And, you know, let's, it's just, it was just a way for me to get, get everybody engaged. And I think that brought us a little bit closer because we made it ours instead of just something for the production. I agree. I, I hope that's a feeling that they can bottle somehow and, and pour on to season four, but we will see. Uh, speaking about your cast family, I wanted to transition into um, what seeing your actually uh, your actual family on set was like. That was something new that hasn't happened before, mostly because uh -huh. of the pandemic. Um, so what happened to your headspace during that? What was going through your mind? Um, standing next to your loved ones and then all of a sudden have to get back in the build. What, what did it mean to have your actual family on set? So when they, when they did that, they had the big video screen set up in the gallery. And I thought for sure it was just going to be like a zoom call with all of our friends and family and be like, Oh, cool. Hi. Hey, how are you? So everybody except for little Emily was facing the wrong way to start with. And then the doors open and I hear my sister's voice stomping, like just run it. Stomping is the wrong word just running over towards me and the footsteps and the Steve and I lost it. I had been, if you watch all of the, the episodes on the risers, there were a couple instances like when the doctors and when Michelle and tacos got eliminated where I got a little misty eyed. But when Val came running out, I broke down. Like I turned, I had to turn away. I said some choice words that I can't say on television it was like, you made me cry. Like you bad word. Um, which is just the dynamic that Val and I have. Uh, she's my one of my best friends in the world, and it's great that I they brought her out. But for me, it would it didn't so much take me out of the build. It actually made me want to focus more and push harder because that was that was at a time when we were really struggling collectively as a group of six people in that room, trying to keep the energy up, trying to push through and get something done. And when they ran out, 
man, that filled the tank and it made everything a lot easier to, to finish. Yeah. That, uh, I, of all the things, all the twists and turns, that was the one I expected the least. <laughs> I was so by that point caught up with Will and his ability to twist things by adding more complexities to a challenge. He started talking about family and how we would talk to the family. I was still manifesting this conversation in my head where he was going to say, and that's what we'd say if we brought your family, but of course we didn't. So like I was absolutely like right off the deepest end could never have prepared myself for that. I had a complete, complete and total visceral shutdown. Um, it, it was not edited that way on TV. Um, I cried <laughs> so much. I cried more at that moment than probably years and years and years combined. Um, I was so happy. I, 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 I don't know if they could, they did the complete quote, but I said, I didn't realize how much I missed them until I saw them. Uh, and that, that was, wow. That was a super, super, super powerful moment for me. Um, we apparently made the camera guys cry. Um, we made Jamie and Amy cry. Will got overwhelmed. We had to stop filming for about half hour, I think maybe, maybe a little bit more because I couldn't compose myself every time I started to talk again. <laughs> I'd get the frog in the throat and I'd start crying. I, I, don't, I guess I'm a big baby. The older I get, the, the softer I get. But I missed my family so much. And to have them there, like, I remember at one point doing the master build and thinking, how am I ever going to explain what I'm doing? Because to, to leave set and leave your creation behind, it would be impossible to say, we built a mountain and there's some trees and there's a lake you needed to see it. I think you needed to actually stand there and, and see it, which I'm so glad my family had a chance to do that. And uh, you could consider it a distraction, but it, it was this invigorating feeling of drive and motivation I had after that. It was awesome. Awesome. That's really cool. Well, my, my last question and probably the last one of this interview then is, um, you know, now you are known quantities. You, you, are, you are members of this community. Um, you are at a particular high point. Um, so how are you going to capitalize on it? And then what is next for both of you? <laughs> capitalize on it. Uh, my next thing that I have to deal with, sorry, my phone charger is bugging me. Uh, but the next thing that I have on my plate that I really want to think about is going to play hockey this afternoon. That's it. Take everything one step at a time and see what happens. I am not, uh, I'm not a fame seeker. I'm not somebody who's going to be on social media answering responses for everybody. Uh, this was fun. It was amazing to do. I'm super happy that Steve asked me to join him on the journey and that we got to do it. And I got to meet some really cool people, but I don't build mocks. I don't, uh, I don't contribute to the Lego community in a meaningful way as a builder. Um, so for me, this was, this was kind of it. This is, this is the end of the road for that. I'm going to keep building my little Lego sets and try and get this, uh, this holiday set that I've been sitting on for weeks into my winter village. And that's about it. As sounds, far as sounds lovely. <laughs> as far as I, I go, Dave, you've known me for years. Um, I I'm an active participant in, in a lot of local con, well, local to me conventions. Um, I hope to spread my wings a little bit more. Um, I've enjoyed the, the ride. Um, I'm it's, it's neat. The things that I didn't expect are the ones that I'm finding the most rewarding. Like, um, crash and I were supposed to do, or we did a meet and greet at our local Lego store. Uh, and we advertised it and fans came and there was a woman that sent me a message and said, Oh my gosh, we, we missed it. We didn't see it until it was too late. I'm like, Oh, we'll be doing other ones. And then we tried to set up other things and she kept missing out and then she sent me this picture kids were creating something just for us to see i'm like come by the fire hall come visit me there so the 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 fan connection has been remarkable i've i've enjoyed it thoroughly and um finding that there's inspiration that other people are getting from some of the things that crash and i did i i love it i really do i'm i had family friends that have been saying for the first time in forever uh, they've they've had family time where nobody watches the show in advance. They all tape they tape it and they sit, all sit down together as a family and make popcorn and, and enjoy the show. And that just warms my heart. I love I love little stories like that. So as far as 
capitalizing on what I can do down the road. If I get a chance to inspire more people to do that, spend more time with their families, step out of their comfort zones and build more. That's a hundred percent what I'm in this for, man. Like I, you've known me for a while, Dave, I'll, I'll be in the community for a long, 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 long time. So I don't think I change as a person. I just think maybe I have an opportunity to give a little bit more now. Well, I look forward to uh, seeing you both again in the future, and uh, and thank you so much for your for your time doing this and for your uh, sharing your hearts on uh, on your sleeves in, in the show. So thank you so much. I owe you a lot of thanks, Dave. I really do. You you've helped me out a lot over the years, and you pointed me in the right direction on some things. So thank you. Well, that'll do it. That'll wrap up this episode. Stephen and Stephen are done. They're out of here. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed listening to them and their questions. Definitely, you could definitely tell that there was some interest still in there that they they felt they could have won that thing, as do I. But alas, we are where we are. So more interviews coming your way here in the next few days. Until we meet again, I'm your minifit ghost, Matt. Let's build on it.